Welcome to the Cannabis Cultivation and Science Podcast. I'm your host, Tad Hussey of Kiss Organics. This is the podcast where we discuss the cutting edge of organic growing from a science-based perspective and draw on top experts from around the industry to share their wisdom and knowledge. If you're enjoying these podcasts, please take a moment to subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher or whatever platform you're listening on and leave me a rating and review. This is really helpful and allows me to keep producing good content by drawing more of the top names in the industry to the show. Also, sign up for our newsletters on our website at www.kisorganics.com. I send out a newsletter approximately every two weeks, and this is the best way to ensure you know when the next podcast has been released. They also have the latest discounts, new product information, blog posts, and what's happening in the industry. Our guest this week is Suzanne Wainwright Evans. She is an ornamental entomologist specializing in integrated pest management. Suzanne has been involved in the green industry for more than 25 years with a primary focus on biological control and using pesticides properly. She is a graduate of the University of Florida with degrees in both entomology and environmental horticulture. She has worked throughout the United States and internationally consulting to greenhouses, nurseries, landscapers, and interior scape companies. She is the owner of Bug Lady Consulting, now in business for over 16 years. If you missed my first interview with Suzanne, I highly suggest you start there. It's episode 15 and will cover much of the basics. Suzanne reached out again recently because she wanted to come back on to clear up some questions regarding the practice of dipping cuttings, as well as discuss prayer options and the critics of biocontrols. Just a reminder, if you are a large-scale commercial cultivator and are serious about consulting or setting up an IPM program utilizing beneficial insects, I cannot recommend her enough. Her website is www.bugladyconsulting.com. If you're a small grower, then I highly suggest that you try to attend one of her upcoming lectures or workshops. We talk about a couple in the show, and I'll have links to them along with other information on the podcast page. She has a ton of information, including her upcoming events, articles she's written, and much more on her website. Please do check it out. Now on to the show. All right. Thanks, Suzanne. I appreciate you coming back on the show. I uh, wanted to, uh, you you had mentioned you wanted to come back on to talk about a few things that we didn't cover in the last podcast and some general questions you've been getting, starting with dipping with propagation. Can you talk a little more about that? Yes. Well, first, thanks for having me back. And thanks for the good, solid email questions that I have gotten. But I, I definitely did get um, a lot of questions about dipping, because I think we kind of just brushed over it. And um, dipping is not complicated. But you do have to understand what you're doing. Um, because if not, you can make some mistakes. But the whole idea of dipping and a lot of this information has come from researchers up in Canada. Rose Boutenhouse is one who's been working on this a lot for things like poinsettias. Because, again, since, since we, um, the, the universities and government researchers really aren't free at this point to work on hemp or cannabis, what we have to do is we have to look to other research and see how can we translate that to help us with this crop. And this is one situation where it started in poinsettias and mums. And even in the ornamental market, it has definitely moved through a lot of other, other varieties of ornamental plants. And I definitely think that in cannabis, this is really critical because again, the pests you're getting, most of them are coming in on cuttings or plant material and you need to have better sanitation practices and, and stop it right at the door. Um, and, and this is the same thing that's been true with poinsettias. We know that when poinsettia cuttings come in, they've been coming in with things like white flies. And so these dip programs have been developed so you can dip your cuttings in a, a solution and then stick them so you can start a lot cleaner. It's, it's not going to guarantee you 100% perfect kill everything all the time, but it's definitely going to get you started um, much cleaner than you would without a dip. And I think with what I've been seeing out on the West Coast um, with the, the growers out there, it, you really, and, and almost everybody has a story of about, well, their grow was clean until 
somebody brought some plants or until they brought some cuttings in. And so this is a way you can stop that from happening. Now, um, I think we might have mentioned a few products before. And you do have to, you know, depending on what state you're in, you have to see what's approved and, and what's not allowed and stuff. So um, I'm going to speak very general. Um, so, you know, you have to think about your situation and see if this applies to yours. But um, soaps and oils are definitely uh, some of the leading dips um, being used. In addition to another product that's being used uh, quite a bit is Botanigard. But when selecting what dip to use, you, you have to look at what are your target pests. You know, Botanigard and soaps have been very popular um, for poinsettias because one of their big issues is white flies. Now, I have seen white fly in cannabis, but it's not uh, as big of a problem, I would say, as like hemp russet mite. There's been a lot more broad mite uh, I've seen lately and two spot spider mites. And Botanigard is not going to really do anything for mite issues. And that's why um, there's a lot of interest looking at a product called Suffoil X, which I know some of you, if you've talked to me, we've talked about. Suffoil X was actually um, tested up in Canada for poinsettias. And when they did their dips, it was at a 0.1%. When you read the label for a spray for this particular oil, which, by the way, is an OMRI-listed product, so it is approved for use in organic production, um, the spray rate is 1%. But in the research where they were dipping cuttings in Canada, it was at a 0.1%. And at that level, they were still able to get the insecticidal properties of killing pests, but they didn't get phytotoxicity from it on the poinsettias, and I believe they tested mums also. Um, in the United States, right now, the Suffoil X from a federal la label does not have uh, dipping on the label. So it's a very, you know, federally, you, you technically can't do it. It's a real challenge because we've got to stop these mites. And this is a product we do have some research on and we have a, a rate for. So I can't legally tell anybody to dip it, but I'm just telling you there's research out there at a 0.1% solution that um, it's shown very good insecticidal properties, or let me call them pesticidal properties, um, at that rate. Now, um, the Suffoil, we're waiting for the dip to come for the label. I mean, it, it's not that it's going to be disallowed. We just need it to show up on the label, but it 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 has shown to be very effective at stopping pests. Um, there is, the information is out there online very easily um, that you can find the research and how they use this 0.1% solution um, to dip in. They've also done combinations, again, with like Botanigard and a 0.5% uh, soap solution um, as a dip. So there are other combinations, but from an efficacy standpoint, we found the Suffoil we, I, I have to say, in ornamentals and cannabis, as a foliar spray product, it has been very, very effective for mite management. But you have to get spray coverage. You have to get spray coverage. And that is what is critical that um, a lot of people will spray it and say, well, it didn't work. Well, no, it's because you didn't get good spray coverage. And that's why if you're doing dips, you get 100% spray coverage. Once you have, you know, a large plant, whether it be a mum, whether you have it cannabis, whether, you know, it be anything, getting 100% spray coverage is nearly impossible, especially when you're using paint sprayers, but that's a whole nother issue. Um, but this way you can start clean. And, and it's been very frustrating to me talking to growers, you know, where like, well, what's your program? And the cannabis people are being too reactive. They're waiting till they get a pest problem and then trying to treat. You've got to do your dips, let your plants dry, and then immediately share predatory mites right out and start on your program then. And I'm seeing too many suppliers of biocontrol agents not 
setting these programs up for growers. They're really doing a disjustice to their growers there on it. Now, there is another product um, I've been looking at, and it's called TetraCurb. TetraCurb is on the 25B exempt list, so it is exempt from EPA registration, so there's no reentry time on it, no protective equipment really requirements for it, and that also is proving to be um, a very effective uh, Miticide for two-spot spider mites. I know they're working on um, testing for different dip rates because, again, dip rates are going to be different than a spray rate. So, But that's another product I think there's a lot of potential with. And from being in grows and seeing the price, people are paying for some of these spray products. You know, the, the stuff oil is so inexpensive to use by in comparison. Um, and, you know, buy the stuff oil from a traditional horticultural supply company. Um, it's, I think it's almost twice as expensive on um, Amazon if you buy it. But if you buy from, you know, companies like Southern Ag, BFG, you know, the, these Carlin, these kinds of people, um, you can get a, a good price on the product and it, it will go a long way for you. Yeah, I did have a question about that. Now, the Suffoil X, you said, was also on the market under another name. Is that correct? Well, you can't. The, the same active ingredient, the oil, is last I saw, you know, and things may change since like a few days ago, but the Monterey Lawn and Garden product, which you can buy at a lot of garden centers in small quantities, that is the same um, uh, highly emulsified oil in there. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. Yeah, I added that to my website. It was a lot harder to get the Cephoil X in as a as a new company to try and offer it to customers. Plus, I think the the smallest size was a couple gallons or like a five gallon jug, which is a lot more than a lot of growers may need that we work with. So, yes, and I just had a discussion with BioWorks about packaging size. So maybe it might be some smaller packaging might be coming sooner than later. Oh, that would be great. I'd love to get in a smaller size of directly from them. Yeah, I was just saying, because remember, a lot of people I'm dealing with do mix up 100 gallons of spray at the time, and they need these larger quantities. But I do understand, and especially when it comes to dipping, you need very small quantities of products. Yeah, so that brought up a couple more questions I wanted to ask you around dipping before we move on. So you mentioned soaps. When I think of soaps, I think of Dr. Bronner's. Uh, but what kind of soaps do you recommend for for dipping and things like that? Impede. You know, again, and this, you know, soaps are a whole nother podcast because a soap is not a soap is not a soap. You have different carbon chain lengths. I mean, there there's some um, organic herbicides that are soaps. And you just never know uh, with soap sometimes what kind of soap is actually in there. Um, it gets scary when people start using detergents. You don't know about what other additives are in there. Impede, insecticidal soap, is designed to be an insecticide. Um, and, um, it, you know, as with any insecticide product, you always have to make sure that, you know, you're not going to have phyto issues. You don't want to use it when your plants are wilted. You don't want to spray it in the middle of the day in full sun. I mean, there's all these things that, you know, you can do to reduce the risk of using or having burn from soaps and oils. You know, the Dr. Bronner thing is... You know, it, 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 I will say it, 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 I know that if you get contact with a mite, you know, you can um, it, you can have mortality. You can kill it. But it, again, it all comes down to spray coverage. You know, with a lot of these products that I, I, it just it depends on how good you spray. And that's it. And there's been no real research on dipping in Dr. Bronner because it's not on the 25B exempt list, nor is it at a registered pesticide. So really, um, it, it's tough for people to do research with it because it's not, you know, recognized really as a pesticidal or insecticidal product in the U.S. And so... You know, you have to be just very buyer beware using that kind of stuff. But that is very, as soon as somebody calls me and says they're using Dr. Bronner, I, I know it's a cannabis grower right from there. <laughs> okay. That's one of those telltale cannabis signs. And I'm not saying it's necessarily a bad thing because, you know what, I would way rather a grower do something like that than go spray, you know, Orthene or, you know, some of these other products that can be way nastier. Um, but, you know, just it's, it's a risk that you can have Fido um, with that stuff. And also Dr. Bronner's has a million different flavors. 
And those innards can make a difference too. But it's basically the soap working as a, a desiccant on on the insects and mites. That's basically what's happening. And when you get impede, again, you're getting the right carbon chain length as an insecticidal soap without all this other stuff in it. Yeah, I typically hear people choosing mint-based Dr. Bronner's ones because they think they'll get some uh, some of the qualities of the, the mint in terms of the pesticidal properties. But oh, Well, let me tell you, Twice this week, I've been with two mint growers because they can't control the insects on their mint. So, wow, yeah, mint's got some great insecticidal properties going. Okay, uh, so a couple other questions I had on this dipping thing. Oh, so, yes. Go, no, no, go ahead. There. Ask them because I've got a list of things to make sure I tell you. Okay, so you mentioned some mixing Botanigard with an insecticidal soap. Can you use more than one product at a time? It well... That is something that has been tested, and we know it works together. Um, you can get yourself into trouble mixing too many things um, at a time because you don't understand how they're going to all interact together. You know, one really interesting study on that is looking at um, nematodes and tank mixing them, uh, well, mixing them in a dip with Botanigard, because we know Botanigard won't kill nematodes, but when they were doing some research at it, they were getting nematode mortality, and it turned out what happened is, they, they, this is what they think is happening, the, the, as the Botanigard settled, it was pinning the nematodes down to the bottom and basically suffocating the nematodes down on the bottom, so it was actually a physical issue of of the two products so it's something that you definitely have to keep aerated and mix but there is work um from BioWorks showing and again BioWorks does have um a technical bulletin out on their website uh, it's called cleaning up incoming plant material by utilizing dips and they have in there where um you know they talk about dipping the you know the putting the nemeshield together with the botanigard and the nemeshield are the nematodes and the rates and how you can mix them all together and and if you're dipping something with roots because i got an email from a grower saying oh you said on the podcast to dip the whole plant in oil and that's n- i I hope that message didn't come across because when we talk about oil dips, we're talking about cuttings, you know, or clones as the cannabis industry calls them, but just the foliage. When people get rooted cuttings in, and we see this much more in ornamentals and even some vegetables, growers are dipping those young plants with the root media in there or the, the, the oasis or whatever uh, media they're using, but they'll tend to dip them in a botanigard, nematode, and root shield um, mixed together. And those three products we know work very well together because then you get the nematodes into the media, which are going to kill West, uh, Western flower thrips, uh, pupa. They'll also kill fungus gnats. And then you get the botanigard giving 100% coverage on the plant. And then you get root shield, which is actually a very good biological fungicide. So BioWorks has really good literature on this telling you h- how to do it, how to mix the stuff up. Um, uh, with these products. So you do have to be careful. Now the rates for uh, the dipping with the soap and the Botanigard, again, that's out of a, a Canadian study, uh, again, that uh, Rose Bowton House was involved with. And, you know, they're reckoning, recommending a 0.5% soap solution. Um, and then they were adding in 125 grams of, per liter of the Botanigard uh, to mix that together to dip. So if you go online and go to you know, university government website and look about dip information, you can find these rates and what's been tested and what we know does play well together in in a dip. Okay. And just to be clear, you're suggesting as well. So if you have a, if you have a facility, you should be dipping even off of healthy mother plants uh, just as part of your, or your IPM strategy. Uh, This is something that everyone should be doing when they're taking cuttings. If if I had a facility, I would be doing that because the risk is too great. You're not talking about a 25 cent marigold. The risk is too great, and with these mites, it's generally just taking one coming in and and something. You know, you 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 may think your grow was clean, but if your employee went somewhere that had mites and they hitchhiked back in, or you know, it, it it's just it's. You know, it's very rare 
that, you know, someone says, oh, I have absolutely no insect problems. I have no mite problems and my grow at all. And most people start clean and end up with problems. So I think it's a good preventative step to do because the cost is low, the labor is low, um, and as of yet, and, you know, things may change as more research comes out, you know, we may find there may be varietal differences, maybe some some cannabis varieties or cultivars don't like to be dipped. Um, as of yet, I haven't had anybody contact me and say this was a problem unless they were doing it wrong. And um, and that's the thing I, I found with some of the emails I got and actually visiting some of the grows that th they weren't dipping correctly because, you know, you want to take your cuttings or, again, your clones you have your, um, and also never take them off dehydrated plants. Make sure the plants are well watered before you take your cuttings, which I think everybody knows that. But, you know, you want to mix up whatever cocktail you're going to dip your cuttings in. It needs to make sure it stays well mixed. Again, if you're using things like nematodes, botanagard, that kind of stuff can easily settle out. If you're doing a lot of cuttings, um, one of the easiest ways to do it is to take two, like, 10, 20 mesh flats, lay the cuttings in there, and have the open parts of the, the mesh flat uh, facing each other. So basically you've made a cage and you could submerge it down and you want to hold it five to 10 seconds and kind of shimmy it a little bit in there um, until no air bubbles come up because that means that once the air bubbles stop coming up that um, there's no air left touching the products down there. I mean, on the, the cuttings, because if there's an air pocket, that means part of the plant's not getting covered. Most cannabis people aren't going to be doing that volume of cutting. So what people do is they basically will just mix up maybe one gallon of solution, put on your gloves, um, and depending, again, what you're using, you might need different protective equipment, but basically taking a hand full of the cuttings and then submerging them and just kind of shaking them, not violently, but shaking them underwater again, you know, 10 seconds or so until no air bubbles come up, pull it out, kind of, you know, drip it off a little bit. And then uh, you can either, some people, you know, will lay them out um, and then, you know, keep them cool to the next day or, you, you know, get them stuck right then um, on there. The thing that I'm seeing, and, and believe me, ornamental guys made this mistake at um, first, but now I'm a little concerned because some of the cannabis guys are. Don't use that dip solution day after day after day because you do have a risk of diseases getting in that water. So, you know, between cultivars or between, you know, different groups of plants, you might want to change that water. So don't hold it over and use it again and again because you will spread problems. Um, and especially if you're using something like botanical, I mean, uh, nematodes, they'll all be dead. They'll end up uh, drowning in the water. Uh, so just mix up what you need and use it. But then the question is, is what do you do with that leftover product after you've dipped your cutting? Do not spray it on your plants. No, 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 no. Don't spray it in your greenhouse. You need to dispose of it however your state you know, allows you to dispose of it. What I know some of my ornamental guys do is they go and they spray it around outside around their greenhouse. You want to just dispose of it properly. Um, obviously, with something like Dr. Bronner's, which again, I, I have no idea on a dip rate for that, that isn't a registered pesticide, so that's easier to dispose of. Um, but you don't want to take, you know, a product that you've just washed all these bad things off your cuttings and go apply it right to your plants. Wow, that was a lot of really good information. <laughs> Thanks for sharing all that. Uh, I could visualize the dipping, so that, that really helped. And I'll try and put up some photos if I can find some, too, to help listeners. Yeah, BioWorks has some. And like I said, you know, I teach these workshops all over the place. And Debbie from BioWorks, I have pulled her with me. In fact, that's what she and I are going to be up in Alberta teaching some classes in, uh, I think it's two weeks or so. Um, one day we're doing ornamentals. One day we're doing vegetables. But I call her Dipping Debbie because she does a really good demonstration, like, when you mix up root shield, what should it look like in the water? When you mix up a tanagard, what should it look like in the water? Make sure, you know, you get it all mixed in because some of those powdered products can clump. Now, I know, like, seeing this is where you've got to know your state because you can't use the powdered you can't use the wet bulb powder in Oregon of the tanagard. So you, you got to, you know, know what your state rules are and use the right formulation. But if you're using a powdered formulation, those clumps are easy to sink to the bottom and you got to get them. And she'll use like a whisk 
um, to make sure that it gets all mixed in. But she does a really, really amazing demonstration on it. Also, uh, the Vineland Research and Innovation Station, uh, Center, um, where, again, Rose Bouton House uh, works, they've been putting together some videos on dipping. Again, a little more poinsettia-oriented, but it definitely will help provide good information. Um, because, again, I mean, I mean, I, I've, you know, I, I was out there, was it a week and a half ago, two weeks ago? I, some of you people listening probably saw me come by your facility, but it, it just, I feel so bad for you guys because you're just not getting good, solid science information. Um, and, and you've got to have this stuff in order to stay in business these days. I want to get into that a little bit, but before we do, we had talked a little bit about sprayers. We didn't give any actual recommendations. I know you love the company DRAMM. That's D-R-A-M-M. Do you have any particular sprayers that you recommend for getting good coverage? I know you don't like paint sprayers. Well, because paint sprayers aren't pesticide sprayers. And this is, I, I am not a... I'm not a spray equipment expert. You know, I, I have my niche of, you know, how how to kill them. And this is, you know, uh, I what I tell my growers to do is contact Graham, Dr Graham, Dram and say, you know, I'm an indoor grow. I'm an outdoor grow. On average, we mix up this much product. This is, you know, and have them tell you what the right equipment is for you because they know their equipment. Um, and that's what's what they're experts at. And you know, I am a firm believer of no one is an expert on everything. And I do. I mean, you, you've seen me in person, you know, unfortunately, I'm an eye roller because like when I meet somebody and I'm like, well, what do you specialize in? Oh, I specialize in everything. No one's an expert in everything. So what you have to do is find the expert in the field you need to talk about. Or again, you know, like you can talk to one expert and they'll say, well, I don't know, but this is the person to go talk to. You know, that, and that's what I do. I built this network of other experts because I, I don't know everything, but I think DRAM has good, solid equipment. It's a lot of what my ornamental guys use. I'm not knocking any other spray company out there. It's just, um, I've just always had um, very, I've heard very good things about them. I see my customers are happy and they're innovative, um, which we'll talk about later about their nematode bucket, which unfortunately I didn't realize that the cannabis industry didn't know about the nematode bucket, but we'll talk about that later. Well, why don't we cover it now since you met, brought it up and we were talking about DRAM already. So you had an experience at the last conference you were at where someone was talking about uh, having trouble getting even distribution of nematodes in greenhouse applications. And you said the solution was out there. Do you want to cover that? Yeah, and it's it's an amazingly simple solution. So there is the, I would call it the sophisticated way to go. So DRAM has made, um, because we were years ago having problems in the order mar market, keeping our nematodes suspended in water. You, 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 you make your stock solution of nematodes up. And again, if you don't have aeration to keep oxygen in the water and you don't have the water moving, the nematodes sink out and you don't get even distribution. And I've had discussions years ago with DRAM and other people. And one thing my growers have done, it, the, 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 this is the unsophisticated answer. You just literally can use a fish bubbler that you can get from a bait store. And it's kind of like instead of, you know, having your, your bait well for your little fish with your bubbler in it, you just drop that bubbler into your bucket of stock nematodes. Now you have to be very careful your bubbler and the, the, what you're using, because people have tried different things, doesn't get warm because you don't want to cook your nematodes and it's easy to cook your nematodes. The idea, again, is to keep oxygen in the water because think of nematodes like fish and you want to keep them moving in the water. And so a fish bubbler can do that. But what DRAM developed, and I know, sorry DRAM, it's a little pricey, but it's easy, it's done, it's simple, and I, it's on my, it's an idiot proof product. And I think sometimes, you know, you're going to pay a little bit more, but it's done and you don't have to worry about it. It's a bucket that can, you can plug it in or it can run off battery and it keeps your nematodes in suspension, in suspension and aerates them. And what, um, my ornamental guys do is they'll take those buckets and then you just stick a dosatron in it. And then you can use that to evenly dose out your nematodes per pot. Um, and you're getting an even distribution. It's, it's, 
it's a beautifully simple answer. And, you know, you can use that bucket for other things you want to keep in suspension. And, you know, you can use a dosatron for a lot of different things to give you better, um, better even distribution in your greenhouse. And Dosatron and BASF, and BASF is the world's largest producer of nematodes, do have literature out there telling you how to use a Dosatron with um, – with the uh, beneficial nematodes and because you do have to remove a filter out of it, but it's actually very simple. And again, if some of you've been to some of my workshops, we actually did a, a live demonstration of this out in California. I think it was about two years ago at the plug and cutting conference. And we are going to be doing it again. I'm, um, for those of you that are coming to the cultivate show, which is the, uh, Right now for the ornamental slash hint of veg in the vegetable in there, it's the largest greenhouse show we have in the U.S. It's in July in Columbus, Ohio. It's like, I think, maybe 30 bucks to get in the door. I think education's maybe $200. It's a really inexpensive show, but it brings about 10,000 greenhouse people. On the Saturday before, I have put together a workshop. In the morning, it is going to be insect ID. You want to learn those five or six aphids you need to know? We're going to teach you. You want to learn the few common thrips? We're going to teach you. Then in the afternoon, we're going to go out to a commercial greenhouse, and I've set up um, with myself and then uh, some of, I will call them my A-team biocontrol producing companies, and they're, they're specific people in their company. I've handpicked who I've asked to help me, and we are going to unpack biocontrol agents and show you how to apply them correctly. And we're going to do everything from wasps to mites to nematodes. So if you want to come learn how to do it firsthand, um, we're going to be doing that there. Unfortunately, well, you know, I'm teaching um, in a couple weeks at the bio biopesticide biocontrol conference we're doing that uh specific biocontrol for cannabis producers but that were limited to being inside uh the hotel there and trust me hotels don't get real excited when you start applying bugs around on things in hotels so we're not going to be able to do live demonstrations there um which by the way I think that that is already sold out possibly because the conference contacted me and asked if they could add more people because I was trying to keep it to a limited size. But they said there's been just so much demand that we might be expanding the size of that. So if you haven't gotten registered, you better register now or get on the wait list if you want to be at that uh, meeting. At, and uh, Tad, you're coming. Yes? I'll be there. I've got my ticket. I signed up right away. So I'm, I'm really excited. I also signed up for the greenhouse uh, tour, field tour, the day before the conference. Yes, well, most likely it's because that's sold out too, and it sounds like because they they want me to go on that to help with information. So I'm probably going to be in a chase car going around with that too. So I'll see you on on that Wednesday too. But you know, for these application stuff, you know, it's one thing to sit here and talk about it. It's another thing to see it being done right in front of you, where you can ask questions and touch the equipment and have the experts in their fields do that. So I think that that is, you know, going to be super helpful that show in in Columbus. And again, it's not it doesn't break the bank to attend that show. I actually last year we did another workshop and actually there were cannabis people that came because again, there is a lot of crossover between uh, cannabis and ornamentals, just like this nematode bucket. Here, you know, the ornamental and vegetable guys, we've had the answer to this, and it's just somehow the information didn't flow over into cannabis. So now here you go, cannabis guys. Here, Here's your easy solution uh, to doing that, either the, the DRAM nematode bucket, and again, they've got videos and information right on their website, or use a fish bubbler and with a dosatron, and, and there you go. Now, with that fish bubbler, are you putting an air stone or anything on the end of it, or are you just putting a line directly in that's just bubbling? It depends on what size people are doing. And, you know, we've done some tests with some of my growers. But if if you can kind of aerate it where the hose is, if you're in a round bucket shooting, so it kind of makes a toilet flushing whirl because, you again, you want to keep everything kind of mixed up. Now, another grower of mine made like a, a, a bigger a bigger one in the middle. It almost looks like a sprinkler head. So it's pushing the nematodes up and they're coming down the sides. But we did find some of the nematodes were getting trapped in the corners there. And that's why DRAM, you know, I didn't realize, because again, I'm not an engineer, but 
I, you know, we were waiting for this bucket for a while, and it was because it was a lot harder to engineer than uh, they thought. And uh, it, and it depends on the again back to the shape of what you're doing because you gotta keep them moving and you don't get them trapped in corners, but you also want to aerate. So look at what you're you're doing. Um, and you know, as long as you're getting them out in a reasonable amount of time, um, you just you don't want to let the nematodes sit for hours in that. Um, you want you want to get them out uh, into your grow. I will warn you, I had one uh, greenhouse operation to run their bubblers. They tapped into the airlines for their, I guess, pneumatic greenhouse tables, because, you know, they, they use the, the, they step on a pedal and it lifts the table up, but there were oil in those lines and then oil got in their nematodes. So I mean, it sounds crazy, but you got to have a clean air source and you have to make sure it doesn't heat up. And that's what Dram said was the other engineering uh, challenge is because if you compress air, it can create heat. And in their early designs, the bucket actually heated up and it would cook the nematodes. So they had to engineer a way to keep the nematodes moving and oxygenated without getting warm. And is chlorine or chloramines an issue when you're using nematodes? I know it can affect the microbial content in compost teas when I look under the microscope, but are you seeing anything with nematodes? Is it a big deal? Not really. I mean, your average tap water, drinking water is fine. And if, 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 if something does kill nematodes, then it would probably be used as a nematocyte out in the farm fields. Okay, fair enough. So one of the things that you mentioned was that information's not making it over from, say, the ornamental industry or the horticulture industry over into cannabis. And some of that relates to, I would say, the, the consultants that are out there. And I know you and I talked off air about that a little bit um, in terms of pricing and the economics of, of the pest management that you're seeing in cannabis. Do you want to touch on any of those topics real quickly? Yeah. So, and I don't know, maybe I'm snob. I don't know. But I, I consider... If someone is a consultant, they just consult. I, I don't understand how you can consult on your own product you're selling. You know, I consider if you are have a product for sale and you're providing information, then you're, you're technical support for that product. Because to me, consultant means unbiased. And that's why I've worked very hard with my business is I'm not financially connected, you know, to, I, I don't get paid by the chemical companies. I don't get paid by the insectaries to, to, to promote their products. I, you know, if I recommend a product, I never never take any kind of kickbacks. And I t it's been tempting at times because people have offered me money. They said, hey, we got this huge sale. Let us give you a commission. It's like, no, I can't take it because that kind of ruins my neutrality that I've worked so hard to build over all these years. Um, so, you know, when, when somebody says they're a consultant, you know, that's for, you know, find out, well, do you sell anything? And the other thing I say always to ask is, is, what, you know, what is your background to, to be giving me advice, even as a technical support person? Okay, you're here to advise me on, on insects. Well, you know, what's your background? How have you been doing this? You know, these kinds of things. And the thing right now with the cannabis industry is because there has been so much money in it um, from the sense of people selling product to cannabis growers. What I have found, and I'm saying this as nice as possible, you can make money selling products and not know anything about your products is, is the biggest thing I've learned in the last you know few years because there's such a demand for products and such a demand for people that are willing to be able to work with the cannabis industry because, you know, the university people can't, the government uh, people can't. And, you know, there still is some stigma out there with some companies where, you know, they don't want to be associated with it. So, you know, the pool of people the cannabis industry can pull from to get help is smaller than if you're a corn farmer or if you're, you know, a mum grower. And so with that, you've got to be able to vet what people say. And my first thing is, is just because you say it with confidence doesn't mean it's true. And that has been, you know, and I literally had a grower that was buying product from a company and the recommendations, I just did not understand the recommendations at all. It was the complete wrong predatory mite for the situation. And I, I asked the grower, I'm like, well, why are you doing this? Well, because the supplier told me to. 
And I'm like, well, did you ask him and question him? Why, why are you telling me to use this mite? And she's like, well, no, because he said it with such confidence. He was so sure the way he said things. So I just believed him. And I don't want to say, you know, you have to be skeptical and not trust anybody. But you, the, the cannabis people just need to do some better vetting. And it's, and it's, it's hard to do because, you know, I, I was at a meeting where I met you um, uh, and, you know, there was a lot of talks on lighting. And I'm not saying anybody said anything about lighting was wrong or bad because you know what? I don't know enough about lighting to even know if what people were telling me was true or not. And as I was sitting there, that's what I was thinking. And they're saying, you know, this is the best to do here and use this here and there. And it's like, how do I know they're true? Yeah, they're standing up on a stage and saying things, but how do we know? And it, it's very hard to be able to vet a subject that you're not educated on. I can only vet really, you know, people that I, uh, I can vet what's being said about subject areas I know about, but like lighting's not one. So, you know, I can't tell you if it's true or not. And, it, and it's how as a grower do you do that? And it's very, very difficult. Um, there, there is no doubt. Yeah, it is difficult. We were talking about that, how at, from the outside looking in, it's, it's almost impossible to know if the information you're getting is good or not. So, how would you, if you were a grower, go about vetting um, go about vetting a potential consultant when it comes to insects? So I, give, I have like my, my list of questions that I will tell to my growers. I'm like, ask these questions and see what kind of answers you get. And that can there, there's certain things like that that are just sure telltale signs um, that they don't know what they're talking about. And it can be to, you know, knowing about lighting on insects and, you know, who needs light, who doesn't need light, things like that. Um, the other thing is too, if, if, you know, you, you have an insect problem and, or let's say, let's say you've got broad mite and I come in and I said, okay, you know, let's, let's use cucumeris. You as a grower should say to me, okay, Suzanne, why are you telling me to use cucumeris? And I just say, uh, well, because uh, it's the best, not good enough. That is not the right answer. We should be able to discuss temperatures, what other crops we've done this in, and all this kind of information. And if any of you, anybody on here listening or if one of the people that I've been in your grows, you know I, and it's almost too much, I'm going to overload you with information um, because I want to give you all the facts and all my years of experience of doing this to be like, this is, you know, what we're, what, um, you know, why we're making these decisions because there are situations in cannabis and I'm, you know, dealing with this a lot. We have a pest, we may not know how to treat it. And I'm going to say, we don't know and let's try this, but here's our contingency plan. Um, and, and anybody that comes in is just like, well, I'm going to solve all your problems overnight. Just buy all these bugs for me and dump them out. That is, that is not a plan. And you have to be very careful on that um, to, to do that. Um, and I don't, want to, I don't want to give you away my like telltale questions necessarily because I know that some of the, the people that sell bios are going to listen to this podcast. And if I get, then they're going to be able to hear the questions. No, that makes sense. I know. It's just such a challenge. And yeah, one of the well, other, you can, you can always contact me. Believe me, I get emails. And again, I'm struggling right now because I do get between like 40 to 60 emails a day right now. And uh, I'm struggling to keep my head above water. But you know, if you just say, Hey Suzanne, you know, you know, you're a smaller girl or something. And you know, you don't necessarily need to, you don't, I'm not looking for people to hire me, but if you just are like, okay, this is where I am at. This is what we're doing. Who's somebody good to work with. I can just be like, go talk to this person, go talk to that person because I, I can't handle, I can't work with everybody. And some people did, they don't need me. I, I'm more of the, the problem solver when everything's gone to crap. I come in and help fix a situation or, you know, do training to like teach you how do you recognize the problems early? How do you set up, you know, better SOPs for, you know, your, your workflow on pest management in your greenhouse. But just as far as, you know, hey, I don't have problems really, but I want to get started with bios. You know, I can definitely point you in the right direction and it's going to depend 
where you are in the United States. Are you an indoor or are you an outdoor grow? What are your key pests? I mean, there is not, I'm not always going to tell everybody to go to one supplier for one thing. No, it, it's, it all depends on those different variables. And there's no reason growers can't do their own research and track data and, and use the scientific method to figure out what works in their environment. So I think that's important too. I mean, consultants can point you in the right direction, but you can still learn a lot yourself. Oh, yeah. And the one thing that I'm seeing with, as you brought it up, the scientific method, cannabis people are not doing controls. And this is what I keep telling people that are buying these six, seven, eight hundred dollar spray products that there's like, you know, five dollars worth of product in the bottle. You know, spray your plants with that triple rinse your sprayer and then spray a couple plants with just water the exact same way and see if you get the same results. Because cannabis growers can get much better spray coverage because you have a much you have a lot fewer plants you know my background is coming from you know where someone has to go spray 10 acres of plants and they're not going to get good spray coverage and that's why you know they're using you know they have these uh, like systemic and translaminar pesticides and things like that um, because they can't get as good a a spray coverage with the soaps and oils. Cannabis, you should be able to get really, really, really good spray coverage. Um, and you can get, they have a, what are called water sensitive cards. They're these yellow cards and they look like sticky cards. And on a side note, sticky cards, if I go into another cannabis grow that does not have sticky cards, I'm going to poke somebody in the eye. You guys need to use sticky cards. But let me go back. I will go back to my focus. So these cards look like yellow sticky cards, but once they get water or moisture on them, they turn blue. And so what my ornamental people will do is they will basically kind of hide these out in the crops and then have somebody come through and spray. And then you can come back and look and see what kind of spray coverage you are getting. And if those cards are still yellow, then that means that area got no product. But, you know, there is you know, something to just washing your plants off with water for things like spider mite management and even aphids, just that physical knocking them off the plant. It also raises the humidity and spider mites don't necessarily like that. So I'm suspect about some of these products, these mega expensive products that they're putting out that I, I think that possibly water is, is doing a lot of the control because we've tested a lot of these products in the ornamental market and we just don't get the results. Yeah, having been in the cannabis industry for a few years now, I'm, it's made me a, a really big skeptic in terms of products and marketing claims. And so the first thing I do when I'm evaluating a product is I want to see all the ingredients. So I want to know that they're willing to list all the ingredients. And the moment I hear the word proprietary, uh, a lot of red flags come out. And then the next thing I look for is, is this product being used in horticulture or in the ornamental industry, somewhere outside of cannabis, or are they marketing it strictly to cannabis? Because if it really worked all that well and had all this efficacy, whether it's a fertilizer or a pesticide, it wouldn't just be in the cannabis industry. So people really need to do their research because the, they're spending way too much money on these products. I totally agree. And, and um, for you, those of you that were at the um, organic meeting where I spoke in Portland, I guess two or three weekends ago, you know, my... The one thing I talked about a lot was poinsettias, and poinsettias make so little money off the plants. You know, they have a few cent profit margins on them, and so if a product is being used in poinsettias, you know it has to work because a grower, like if I go to a poinsettia grower and say, okay, we're going to spend five cents more a plant, they are going to be like, there's the door, because they can't afford to put a five more cents of input into that plant. So that's a good indicator. If it's something that is used in poinsettia production, actually used, you know it works because you, the poinsettia guys can't afford to use it unless it does work. And we do a lot of product testing in poinsettias because, again, the, the product profit margin is so slim. And I can't remember if I mentioned this before, but one of my greenhouse growing operations, the ornamental ones, we did order in for entertainment purposes, I will say, you know, a bunch of these cannabis products uh, that are, you know, on the 25B exempt list. Um, so they don't have to have EPA registration. And we tested them and we just we either burned the plants up or we just didn't get get any kind of control with them. And um, so you have to be very careful. Um, and I mean, like, I think stuff oil is a good example. And I don't, you know, 
keep going back to that, you know, I mean, it's not that, you know, again, this is not a commercial for stuff oil, but just looking at costs where you can get a jug of stuff oil, I think from the horse supply companies, it's maybe $60, $70 for a large jug. I think Amazon, I think they want like 120 where I'm seeing products that have half the size of that and they're being sold for six or 700, which don't have the efficacy or safety track record. And also these plant botanicals, we don't know how they impact the biocontrol agents. We, we have a solid history with using stuff oil X with predatory mites. But once you get into plant extracts, as we talked about, some of the plant extracts have repelling qualities. We know neem is a repellent. Doesn't seem to work well enough to repel all your pests away, but there is some research showing, you know, where they spray leaves with neem, they spray leaves with azadiractin, they put predatory mites on them, and they're just like, nope, we're not going to stay. As compared to untreated leaves, they will stay on. And you know the period with Cephalx of when you can start reintroducing. Yeah, stuff oil, once it's dry, we'll, we'll spray on a Monday, we're releasing on Tuesdays. Um, now, with the Tetra Curb, I just had a conversation with them. I think they're, after their mitocide product, uh, they're saying they, w they just feel comfortable as a general rule, two days. Um, is what they're recommending on that. And, you know, they're being very general because, well, are we releasing Cucumeris, are we releasing Swirsky, are we releasing Persimilis? Because when you get into more specific chemistries, I think Fluoromite's a really good example, even though legal cannabis, you know, they're not using it. But Fluoromite has always been very toted, touted as very safe with, with beneficials and predatory mites. It's interesting because it's very safe with using Persimilis and uh, Cucumeris, but it can be very toxic to Swirsky. So when you get into some of these other chemistries, you have to specifically uh, look into, you know, the specific, you can't just paint with a broad brush. And as soon as a product says to me, we kill pests, but we're safe with beneficials, I call BS on that product because whether something is a pest or a beneficial is all subjective to who you are and what you're trying to do. The products are not sentient and can't make those decisions. And so that's another telltale on products for me is, is how they are marketing, what their claims are. And with the 25B products, they technically – they're supposed to not make false claims, but they're not really getting police. And I've seen crazy claims of products being systemic when they're not, and, and eventually it will probably catch up with them. Because, again, with the 25B, you know, you can list whatever insecticide you want, but you, you're not supposed to lie on those labels. And if the government does come and knock, and you better have proof of your claims. And, and again, it, it's, it, eventually they're going to start cracking down. Yeah, and you mentioned, I would just throw that that also includes plant washes as well. People are listing things as plant washes and then telling you, you know, off off label that they're insecticides. So that's something else to watch out for. Yeah, because they've proven you don't know what's in them. Yeah, and you also mentioned that phytotoxicity is not always something you can visually see. So some of these botanicals may have an impact or be stressing the plant and you might not even realize it. Yes, and, you know, they they did that the the most... I think the most textbook study of that was with, you know, when they were using the ivory soap um, on tomatoes where they got lower yield using ivory soap and compared to an insecticidal soap, even though you don't, didn't see phytotoxicity on the plant, it definitely affected the yield on that. So I want to circle back around. We talked a little bit about other consultants out there and some of the recommendations you were hearing that you weren't very excited about. And one of the things you had mentioned um, sorry, off air was that consultants were not recommending treatment and propagation or early in the plant's life when there's so much less leaf tissue uh, and it's easier to, you know, easier to do lower rates. Do you want to touch on that a little bit? Yeah. And see, this is what makes me think that they don't know what they're doing or they're just trying to make more money off, off the growers. And you know what? Everybody deserves to be in business. Everybody deserves to make a living. I am not trying to take a living away from anybody. Just... You know, when you have to do pest management and propagation, you cannot wait. Because if you wait, you may not be able to treat the problem or it may be too expensive to treat for the problem. And it can get very expensive to try to be curative. And I'm sure a lot of people out there are going to be shaking their heads because they look at the money they've spent. And some of these recommendations I've heard, if, if just the person had said, hey, this is what we're going to do for that, I could have told you from the beginning it wasn't going to work. 
Um, I, now, now, granted, I don't know everything. In some situations, and you know, we don't know, but there's some things we know just aren't going to work. And you have to be, you know, talk to more than one person. I, I tell all my growers, work with at least two different insectaries, you know, so that you have, you know, you have more than one person to talk to, um, like Kelly Vance with Beneficial Insectary. I think he does a great job, but I guarantee you, he will not be offended at all if, you know, you turn around and you go ask, you know, like Paul Cool from BioBest, you know, hey, we've got this problem. I think that people like Kelly and Paul will kind of be glad that the grower is taking initiative to do your homework. And what you'll often find is that with these people that I think have been doing a very good job, you'll get very similar answers. Not that you always have to do the exact same thing to get the same answer because you can have spider mites and there's possible different routes to take to manage spider mites. But I, I don't think that with the, these good solid pest management people get upset when you question their recommendations because again, it makes me feel good when you question me. It, it does because that means you care and you're taking the time to educate yourself. So you just have to be very careful um, with these recommendations. And if somebody's working with you and if they have not put together a program for your propagation or, and you know, they've been just focusing on, you know, releasing at the end of the crop, I would say find somebody else to work with. You've got to start in propagation. And, you know, and, and, and again, I hate keeping going back to ornamentals, but like with ornamentals, we're sticking our cuttings and we're getting the beneficials right out. They all get nematodes, you know, right as soon as they're stock. And, you know, you, air quotes here because you've got to look at your media and, you know, those kinds of things and how you're propagating because they're not going to work in all systems. But if, if you're rooting in soil, you should be putting nematodes right in from the get-go. I mean, that's just standard, that's standard inexpensive practice because if you can stop the fungus gnats then, I'm not going to get the call when you're out in your grow with a mascara brush trying to brush, you know, fungus gnats out of your blooms. Yeah, and the last thing I want to touch on on this subject is pricing. So you said you've seen some pretty dramatic price increases for cannabis growers over other crops. Well, I don't know. I, I won't say it's a price increase. I will just say that the cannabis people are paying way more than than um, the ornamental markets are. And I will say this very delicately as possible without everybody hating me. And I'm sure I'm going to get some nasty emails, but it's typically through the distributors I'm seeing some pretty exorbitant pricing. Now, I do understand, you know, that if they're – if they're calling on you, they're providing a good service, they're educating you, you know, you do have to pay for some of that in your pricing. There, there's there's no doubt about that. I, I think that, you know, if you pay 5%, and I'm just making that number up, 10% more, but you're getting good customer service, it's worth it. You know, and I have no problem for, I mean, I don't think that's an issue, but what I take issue with is I'm seeing as much as, you know, 100% if not more price increases and they're just not even getting good information. So so the bottom line is people need to do their own research. As a grower, you need to you need to look shop around, you need to find out who knows what they're talking about and double check what they're telling you with someone else. So that that just puts the onus on the grower is all it really comes down to. Right, right. And I mean and and and, and the thing is is it may seem like a huge hump at first, but once you get over this hump and you learn these basics, then it, it gets easier. Sadly, I don't think my job gets easier every year, but because I always have new challenges. But, you know, you once you've experienced a problem and been able to get through it, you know, then, you know, for the next time. And it does get easier as for a grower when you're dealing in a, a mono cropping system in that way. And again, with the information I mean, I really feel like the cannabis industry has hijacked the Internet. Just be very, very, very careful and selective about what you read online. And, I mean, years ago, I had to stop trying to answer all these questions. And now it's like I even struggle with some of the, the groups, the, the, 
message boards because I just I get mad because I see what growers are being told to do or someone puts up a picture of an aphid and someone's like oh you know that's a winged uh, you know fungus gnats because but they say it so assertively like they know and and it's not accurate information so you just really have to you have to educate yourself and you have to go to good sources to get educated so that you are no, more knowledgeable and you're not spending you know i've i've heard growers paying a dollar a sachet you know for the release systems and you know ornamental guys and again there's differences in pricing between biocontrol agents you know is it cucumeris in there is it swirsky in there is it andersoni in there and then also volume you know, if you need five sachets, you know, you're probably going to have to pay more than my grower getting 10,000 sachets. But, you know, the the sachets with like cucumeris, you know, they can be, you know, ornamental people are paying maybe 15 cents for those, you know. And to hear people paying, you know, these exorbitant prices. And again, everybody deserves to make a living. And, you know, the distributors do need to have a bit of a markup for their business, for the service they're supplying applying and everything but it better come with some really 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 good information and some amazing customer service if uh you're you're getting those kinds of markups um i don't think it's been any secret for me i mean i really push my growers to you know buy a bit more direct from the insectaries in the sense of having the product drop ship direct to the insectary direct to you from the grower but if you got three plants at your house you're not going to be able to your the volumes are going to be too large the packaging is going to be too large for you to do that the insectaries are really set up to be sold to commercial growing operations yeah and something i want to touch on again that you mentioned that i think is important that we've kind of uh glossed over is once you have an IPM program in place and once you have the right procedures in place with the dipping and the scouting and you have the right staff there, it it becomes very easy. It's not like at that point that you're putting in all this time and energy and money into biocontrols. It, It really runs itself. So I don't want people to get discouraged like you mentioned because I think that it is very possible and you you're working with people that are doing it already and doing it really well. So and, you know, this idea that biocontrol doesn't work. So when do, when do I get a phone call when they have sprayed and tried everything and they want me to come, you know, sometimes fix the problem because they, they can't get it under control? And this is true across, you know, all crops. But the thing with, with the, the cannabis, again, if you start early that you don't get there, but imagine cannabis growers out there. If you had to grow, you know, 200 varieties of plants and you perpetually had new cuttings coming in the door from other countries and from other growers and you had this perpetual train of pests coming in and how hard that is to manage. This is why not all, but a lot of the ornamental people have definitely shifted into using the biocontrols, especially in propagation, because they're able to stop the problems there before they get started. And also, they're not spraying pesticides there that um, can create resistance issues. Even if you rotate pesticides through modes of actions, you can still develop resistance issues. And, you know, you, when you get spider mites in your greenhouse, you don't know necessarily their pedigree. If they had come, um, you know, from an ornamental crop where they've had exposure over and over to different chemistries, you know, some of your chemistries may not work. So you don't know the pedigree of the pest you have. And even if some of, I will say, the synthetic pesticides will work. And that's why we go back to the soaps and oils, because they're more of a physical kill. And they really don't care as much about you know, what genetics you have for resistance. And I have, a, I have a Bug Lady Consulting t-shirt that says you can't build resistance to being eaten. And so, you know, with some of these pests, we're dealing with a lot of white flies, spider mites, and aphids that are resistant to a lot of chemistries. Well, you know, when that lace wing comes and chows down on you or that parasite comes and sticks her egg in you, she doesn't really care that much if you're resistant to, you know, orethene or avid kind of thing, you know. Um, and so that's why there's been this real growth too with the biocontrols is because of we don't have to worry about resistance issues that much Um, and even so far with a lot of the microbial products we haven't had any resistance issues to like Bavaria bassiana or trichoderma or things of those nature and also with a lot of the beneficials you know some of them are limited on mobility they can't fly um, but 
you know, they, they are going to search high and low on that plant to find a food source. And most of the chemicals you are using in cannabis, well, they're not systemic. You guys can't use the systemic products. You're using contact products. So unless you get 100% spray coverage, you're not going to be able to get them. And one of the big things that came up um, that we discussed at the meeting in Portland a couple weeks ago there's no such thing really as a systemic miticide out there. If someone's saying they have a systemic miticide, again, move on down the road because it's not true. I'm, I'm not going to, and you know, you, you, we'll probably get into that more at the, the, the biocontrol cannabis conference in California, but um, it just doesn't really exist because of the way the chemicals move in the plants and plant biology and, and physiology and the way insects and mites feed differently in plants. It's a whole nother discussion. So really when you have critics that are saying the biocontrols don't work, you really want to focus on some of the variables associated with the, both the, you know, the application, so like the sprayer that you're using, the uh, consulting advice and the rates, even if you're applying the right, the right bugs to deal with the right situation in a given environment, or even the quality of the insects that people are purchasing to know that they're alive and fresh and arriving in a, in a condition where they're going to want to eat whatever the pest is. So... Uh, I, I think there's a lot of variables though that people need to consider before they jump to biocontrols don't work. And I, I just, I think that's a factor. Right. And what cracks me up to no end is, and again, this is across the board, ornamental, vegetable, cannabis, everybody. People will spray a pesticide. It doesn't work. What do they do? They spray it again. It doesn't work. They'll still spray it again. And you'll see this, but you know, one little hiccup in a biocontrol program, they're oh, biocontrol doesn't work. Not... Not the fact of, and, and, and I, the top reasons I will say now, and, it, and it's changed through the years. Like, if, seriously, if we were doing this podcast, let's say 20 years ago, 20 years ago, and I was actually selling biocontrol agents 20 years ago. My first one of most issue would be, you know, we really didn't know a lot what we were doing, and we were having to do a lot of trialing. So we expected failure. But then also, product quality wasn't as good. Today, the reason I'm seeing people failing, honest to God, is I think the number one thing right now, and I will say cannabis, and I will even include ornamentals in this, is, is bad advice. I, I just, I, I, I mean, it's just some of the basic simple stuff. I was in a greenhouse that runs at 60 degrees, and they were putting out Swirsky for control of Western flower thrips. Swirsky does not like to be at 60 degrees. You need little tiny mittens for the Swirsky and scarves for them in there. It's too cold. And, you know, this is where I'm like, why is this person even making this recommendation? They should know better. And so right there, that program was failing solely because it was a bad recommendation. Now, from the, again, product quality standpoint, um, and periodically I do, you know, these product quality workshops on how to assess your, your biocontrol agents, but we've gotten way, 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 way better on it. And I think as long as the products come to you from the insectaries um, and, and the key, the key players as far as insectaries, where are the bugs coming from? You have BioLine, you have BioBest, you have Colpert, you have Beneficial Insectary, and also BASF. Now, BASF just does the nematodes. So that they're only a nematode producer. But these other four companies, those are, I would say, the, the, the largest producers. And like Copper, it's probably largest in the world. BioBest is probably behind them. And BioLine might be right up. I'm not sure where, if they're right behind BioBest. But those are the, ba the big insectaries. Now, most of them have production overseas. I mean, if you go look at a map, you know, there's production in Canada and Mexico and in different locations in Europe and Spain and Africa. So they have multiple insectaries. Um, but a lot of the product we're getting here in the U.S. does come from um, Europe. Um, that And it is, it's FedExed over. And then so it comes from Europe over to here. And then it goes to the insectary. And then if you're buying from an insectary, it comes to you from there. Now, if it's going to a distributor that distributes it physically themselves, so then it gets shipped to the distributor. And this is where things, you know, how long is it at the distributor for? You know, I've gotten emails before from companies, distributors that have overordered, and it's like we're sitting on all this product. Do you know of anybody that wants to buy it? Well, that's another day the product's been there. And some things can handle that, but other biocontrol agents don't do so well. I mean, like Persimilis, man, you want that 
out of the bottle the second you get it. There's been research done on how they can cannibalize themselves in packaging, uh, the persimilis. So you really, you need to know your sourcing. And that's another thing. When you do go to buy from a distributor, whose product am I getting? Am I getting BioLines? Am I getting BioBest? Because there are different packagings. There's different carriers. There's differences between the company and different companies. And, you know, I, when I talk to people that are buying through distributors, I'm like, well, whose product are you getting? They're like, well, it just depends. The thing is, is you, is you get familiar with the way packaging is. You get, again, familiar with carriers. I mean, a good example is if you look at aphid parasites. You get it from BioLine. There's no carrier in the bottle. You get it from BioBest. It's got buckwheat hull in there. You get it from Coper. They have like a sawdust carrier. And so you do have to do different release methods for those products. Um, Beneficial Insectary doesn't use a carrier in there. So you, you, you have to know what to expect, and you don't want to have carrier one week and not a next, and the person going to put them out gets confused. So, you know, these are all things that have to be looked at when trying to make a program work. And I think sometimes people are getting products that are a little old. Um, and I've actually, on some of the microbials, I've had growers buy products that were expired through distributors. Um, that are holding the product. So you have to, you know, you got to watch all that stuff um, and, and be aware of all of that. And then the other reason um, I do see biocontrol programs fails is pesticide residue. That there's something on the plants that um, we, we didn't know about um, or that was sprayed and that is incompatible with a biocontrol agent. That's another reason we can have issues there. Great. Well, I think I covered, or we covered all the topics that I wanted to cover today. Was there anything else you wanted to chat about before we sign off for listeners? Um, I don't think so. And again, you know, again, I'll say it again. People deserve to be in business, but, you know, just, I, I think for the cannabis industry, people need to do a better job getting information to the cannabis industry. As a cannabis grower, you need to just you know, put on your thinking cap, as my mom used to tell me to do all the time, and, you know, a, you know, analyze what you're being told. I mean, does it make sense someone is telling you to dissolve aspirin in water and water your plants? Does that really make sense? And if you think about some of these things growers are being told to do, it just, it, it doesn't. Um, and back to the root aphid issue, which, you know, I got some emails about that. We're doing work looking at nematodes on root aphid. I didn't say we had the solution for that. I'm still, right now, my strongest recommendation is still using Botanigard, but you got to apply the Botanigard correctly. You know, you can't just, you know, magically spritz it on the soil surface and expect your root aphids to go away. And, you know, there's differences between the soils. Um, of volume of pots, there's a lot of variables in it, but I just don't feel comfortable enough recommending nematodes, rove beetles, or even, you know, hypoaspis miles, which is now Australopsis, as a control option for root aphids. They may help suppress it, but I've talked to people that have spent thousands of dollars on those three previously mentioned biocontrol agents and not gotten control of root aphids or even suppression of it. So um, be careful about the information you're getting out there. And when someone makes a recommendation, you know, does it suppress it or does it control it? That's a big difference there. That was entomologist Suzanne Wainwright Evans, also known as the Bug Lady. Her website is www.bugladyconsulting.com. I posted the links and information we discussed in this podcast right on the podcast page at www.kisorganics.com. Just click on the podcast menu on the top of the home screen. And don't forget to sign up on our website right on the homepage so you can stay up to date with all the latest information and podcasts right when they come out. You are listening to the Cannabis Cultivation and Science Podcast. I'm your host, Tad Hussey. Thanks for checking out the show and stay tuned as we have some more great episodes coming up, including Chris Jagger of Blue Fox Farm and founder of the Living Soil Symposium, which is coming up soon. And also Ben Hartman, owner of Clay Bottom Farm and author of The Lean Farm and The Lean Farm Guide to Growing Vegetables, two books that have revolutionized the way we manage our farm. Thanks for listening.